Uh, first off, I just wanted to, well, I, my name's Eric Lloyd. I'm with 9 and 10 News in Northern Michigan. Um, wanted to ask you kind of, if uh, first give me some of your background, why you give you the chance to explain why you want to be Secretary of State and why people should vote for you. Yeah, our voting rights are a necessary component of our liberty. And oftentimes when we talk about voting rights, it's talked about in a very myopic perspective. We need to have a robust conversation regarding what exactly our voting rights are. And we often just talk about it in context as if ballot access. Ballot access is key because if you can't access the ballot, what good was the election? But there's also ballot security. With more and more Michiganders exercising their constitutional right to vote absentee, we need to ensure that the ballot is secured every step of the process. Additionally, uh, we want to prevent any illegal ballots from being cast because a ballot nullification also is a form of suppressing one's voting rights because you that can dilute uh, a person's legal vote. So that's why I'm running for Secretary of State and to ensure that the SOS office is operating per the rule of law. And that's not going on currently. The office is highly politicized. And when we politicize a government offices beyond what, you know, there is some partisan realities, especially if you're running for Congress or governor, but Secretary of State's office actually is a nonpartisan role. So irrespective of party, people want to ensure that they can get quality service when they go into branch offices or people who are auto dealers and auto repair facilities who get inspections by the Secretary Secretary of State. That's not a partisan job. And then also protecting our voting rights. My background is in education. I, you know, and I, it's not like I'm a person who's held a government job. So that may seem shocking to many people, but I actually believe that many people find it refreshing simply because oftentimes career politicians, and I know sometimes when that phrase is used, career politicians, it sounds like I'm saying a political ad, but the reality is when you have people whose whole life is government, then their decisions are filtered through the lens of, I need to keep my job or I need to move to a, a promotion, which is a higher office. When you have everyday citizens like myself, we're, we're, I'm just doing it because I love my country and I see an issue that I'm determined to fix. So I don't look at it from the lens of, I need to keep my job because I have experience in other things that I oftentimes I, I don't wanna have my life picked apart or lied about. You know, those things are frustrating, but that's just the reality of running for public office and I'm prepared to deal with it. And to go off that, because especially this uh, election cycle, uh, especially the Republican Party has been a lot of these political outsiders and the people that haven't held office, whether it be the, the governor's race or, or you and Mr. DiPerno. It seems to me you, everyone is a political outsider until they are a politician. Mm -hmm. then. So um, it's one of those things where you fight against the people, but then you become who you're fighting against if you make office. How How are you not going to let that taint you, I guess, going forward. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It's like you're an outsider to then you become part of the establishment, to your point. But the goal is to not get corrupted. That's what happens. So it's not so much that you'll have people in office for a long time as though that's inherently bad in and of itself, because if you do a really great job, then people are going to want you to run for higher office. The problem is, is that many of these people, they make their decisions through the lens of, will this help me achieve higher office or will this help me maintain this office instead of, is this what's best for the citizens that I have sworn duty to serve? That's the issue. That, that's the big concern is that you have these individuals, you know, who've never held a job in the private sector. I mean, they don't know what it's like to be on the other side of a government service. So that's a problem. They don't know what it's like to deal with the consequences of government decisions. And that's why our elections are so important. I mean, the people we place in office, they have the power to put us in jail. I mean, think about that. So we want to ensure that we're picking not just a competent, um, uh, moral, ethical people, but also that process to which we pick these ethical people is also secure and honest. And you kind of touched on it before, but uh, when talking about the Secretary of State position, everyone is always talking about elections, but there's just so much more to the job. What are you going to be able to bring to the other aspect, um, at other half of the job that uh, comes with the office? So when it comes to our branch office operations, we need to ensure that we have both the walk-in and appointment service. So I have no intention on doing away with the appointment system. We need it. It's just very convenient for many people's lives. But we also need the walk-in system because that's also convenient for many people's lives, especially our business owners. If they purchase new company vehicles, they don't have time to wait for extended periods of time to get into a branch office, but also for people who live in densely populated cities who are oftentimes unbanked or underbanked, that creates a situation where those people cannot utilize online 
online services. They cannot utilize kiosks because not all kiosks take cash. And then if it's a densely populated city, they may have to wait a, a while, a week or two to get into a branch office to get an appointment. And then also with the appointment system uh, for people who do not have internet access, that could be very difficult scheduling an appointment. So we want to maintain that walk-in system also for our seniors. You know, many seniors, it's not because they're stupid. They just didn't grow up like a millennial using technology. So it's just not part of their wheelhouse. So what happens is that as we quote unquote modernize, we have a tendency to leave behind other people. So we need to ensure that any modernization is, is, is cognizant of the needs of individuals who may not be uh, prepared to make that transition. We don't want to just say too bad for you. Maybe you should keep up. That, that's unacceptable. And then we also want to identify areas where we can lower fees that people pay. Uh, when you look at the fact that the Secretary of State brings in $2.9 billion a year for the state of Michigan, and only 7% of that actually goes to running the Michigan Department of State, that shows us that we're paying way too much for our SOS services. Now, I know we do have some responsibility of maintaining the road. I mean, I utilize this public road. It's not like the people who build it do it for free. So somebody has to pay it. But at the same time, we want to make sure that what we're paying in our SOS office actually represents the cost of doing business and not some scam for people to grease the palms of their friends. Also, when it comes to our auto dealers and auto repair facilities, and it's kind of interesting with the Secretary of State, there's a lot of little niche responsibilities, as you will, that people don't think about. Like the Secretary of State oversees driver's training schools. So I'm going to pause before I get to auto dealers and auto repair facilities, like driver's training schools. One of the things I would like to see is that we go back to what we used to do a long time ago, where driver's training was actually done in high school as well. And that can be an opportunity, not just for students and families to cut the cost, because for many families, that's a big financial burden to have to put your child through driver's training. Driver's training. What if that was an option elective at school? That would help those families. And then it's also beneficial to the business because now they already have customers already prepared. So this wouldn't put a dent in their business either. So it will be a win-win for everybody. And with traffic, traffic deaths being such a common cause of death for young people, I think that we as a society could do our part and ensure that our young people are better prepared to hit the roads. Because as you know, a car can be a deadly vehicle. So there's lots of things. And then also in terms of our auto dealers and auto repair facilities, one of the things that they're complaining about is that these unfair inspections. So the Secretary of State's role when inspecting an auto dealer and auto repair facility to be ensuring that the consumer is protected, not use it as an opportunity to raise money for the SOS. When the Secretary of State does a reg an inspection at an auto dealer or auto repair facility, they can charge that business whatever they want. And they're um, oftentimes are not distinguishing between an honest mistake and a pattern of practice, creating a situation where a, auto, a lot of auto dealers and auto repair facilities, if they have a question, they're scared to call the Secretary of State because it may spur an inspection. So we want to be a friend to the community, not an adversarial force. So those are things, I mean, there's lots more but those are some of the things that I would see change as Secretary of State. Okay. And then heading back to the election, uh, your opponent, one of her biggest uh, attacks against you is using the term election denier. First, I want to get your reaction to that term used in uh, towards you. And then also, even with those questions abound, how can voters be confident in this top state election official having questions uh, uh, on how the process is being run? Yeah, that's why I'm running. I mean, if I thought my opponent was doing a good job, I wouldn't be running. <laughs> so the whole concept is kind of foolish in itself. It's like, oh, you're denying that the election was ran well. Yes, I am. That's why I'm running. You did a terrible job. So this is, I mean, that's that's why people should run for public office. If you see a problem, you should go into it with the spirit of wanting to fix it and not somebody wanting to achieve power. I mean, my opponent was literally groomed for public office. We do not need any more people who've been groomed for public office. We need individuals who are everyday citizens like myself who saw a problem and want to fix it. My opponent refuses to remove dead people from the qualified voter file. There's no excuse for that. There's a lawsuit against her right now regarding that. The Secretary of State is keeper of the records. They're keeper of the great seal. They know who's dead. They know who's alive. They have access to the, they maintain, not access. They maintain the driver's license file. They maintain the qualified voter file. They know the difference. They also are involved in operating the street index, even though that's more the local clerk, but still they're involved in that. So they know the difference between a commercial property, a residential address, or a vacant lot. They know the difference. So there's no excuse for someone to be registered to vote at the UPS store at a vacant lot. So that's her job. She's failing at her job. Um, also, the judge, a judge has slapped her down for five, the fifth time for breaking the law. I mean, this is someone who's supposed to be an attorney, but yet they keep breaking the law. So, you know, she can call me names, but that's all she has. She can't refute the fact that she's habitually broken the law. She'll just go, oh, they're lying. These are election deniers. They're spreading disinformation. Of course, is she going to raise her hand and say, yes, I'm a criminal? No, she's not. Of course, she's going to 
to call me names. That's all she has. But she can't answer the people. Why does she refuse to move, remove dead people from the voter rolls? Or she'll claim there's been multiple audits, audits conducted by her, the person in question. That doesn't make sense. If anybody else in America, you or myself, have been accused of an illegal action, we don't get to investigate ourselves. There's going to be a third body do that. So, I mean, she could call me all the names in the world. That's fine. I'm not bothered by that. But what bothers me is that the people of this state are being deceived and not understanding that the process is not being operated per the rule of law, which is her constitutional duty. And then uh, I wasn't able to make your press conference earlier this week about your lawsuit, mm -hmm. but I wanted to hear from you kind of your issue and what you uh, are uh, trying to get done. So I, I want to, I'm glad you asked that. I want people to understand our goal is not to suppress or make it hard for Detroit residents to vote. That is absolutely false. We are not seeking to make Detroit residents present themselves. The problem we found ourselves in is that we recently found out that the city of Detroit is using a machine that was privately funded that is illegal for use in Michigan's elections. That's right there has run afoul of the law. Jocelyn Benson is supposed to be all over that, but she's not. Then they're using this machine to verify signatures. That's also illegal. That is her responsibility to speak up and say something. The Board of Election Inspectors is supposed to verify signatures. Additionally, this machine is connected to the qualified voter file, which not just impedes on the voting rights of Detroiters, but also Michiganders as a whole. So the signature verification process is the only mechanism of security we truly have when it comes to absentee voting. And since Detroit is not following the law, we are seeking guidance from the court, but we do not want to see, our goal is not to make it hard for Detroit residents to vote absentee or make them physically present themselves. Our goal is guidance from the court on how to remedy this issue of Detroit using this machine, which is totally illegal. And instead of using the process of having the Board of Election Inspectors do signature verification. Additionally, Detroit is duplicating ballots outside of the law. I personally witnessed this. This is completely illegal. The adjudication process they use is illegal and highly questionable. They are not securing the absentee ballot drop boxes, which we have a legal right to have. And then additionally, they are not posting on election day at 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. the absentee ballot counts. And so when people inquire about this, they just go and call everybody a racist. I'm Black. It's nonsense. The citizens of Detroit and the citizens of Michigan are constantly constitutionally entitled to a secure election. And for some reason, but many people want to act as though this is a horrible thing. And so I, I deeply question their motives for those claims. So you say you say you don't want you're not looking to suppress vote you're looking for an accurate vote but what if the remedy that you're searching for involves throwing away thousands of votes of, and Detroiters don't have a chance to make that up in the next five days? That's not an option. We we do not want to we do not want to see legal votes. That will not happen. I would not support an effort that tosses out legal votes. The goal the reason why the signature verification process is so important and actually my opponent actually using her own words against her. It was a debate between her and Senator Jim Runstead on Let It Rip, where she claimed that the signature verification process is better than picture ID and establishing identity of a voter, which I think is nonsense. But she claimed this process is so critical to security. So then why would she permit Detroit to weaken that process? Because when a signature verification process is not being ran per the rule of law, then you open the door for tons of illegal ballots to get mixed in with the legal ones. And that that is voter dilution. And so when we saw the Bush v. Gore case, that went up to the Supreme Court, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her opinion, wrote that uh, voters have a constitutional right from protection against voter di vote dilution. So again, that's the problem. They're allowing the illegal ballots to be mixed in with legal votes, and that nullifies people's votes. So this is not some crazy voter suppression concept. That's the issue. We just don't want to see the illegal ballots mixed in. But in no, no way, shape, form, or fashion would I stand by while people's legal votes are tossed out. That that's Neither one is an option. That's the point. We're saying neither one is an option. So we just want the court to step in and find a solution to ensure that we have an accurate election. Okay. And uh, you kind of touched on some things, and I'm not sure as a candidate for Secretary of State how much you can co comment on it, but Proposal 2 is looking to expand voter access and make nine changes, I believe, is the number. Is there any, are, are any of those nine something that you support? Are you for all nine? Are you against all nine, kind of, or is it somewhere in the middle that we still need some changes made? You know, I have a big problem with Proposal 2 because they claim that um, they're going to um, place in our Constitution a uh, voter ID. That's just simply not true. It's not going to be required. It's optional. 
it's going to be in the Constitution that it's optional to have voter ID. So that right there, the fact that they're engaging in deception, that makes me distrust everything else flowing from that. Also, I have massive issues with the private money in elections. As I mentioned, that $750,000 machine in Detroit that they're utilizing that's privately funded and illegal for use in our elections, again, it's privately funded. So it is a responsibility of the state considering how much millions and billions of dollars, not billions, excuse me, billions of dollars we bring in to ensure that our elections are properly, properly funded. It's not to say that clerks will break the law. I'm, I'm not making that claim. I mean, I don't care what profession you're in. I went to theology school. There are crooked pastors. There's crooked people in every profession because it's the issue is human nature, not the profession. However, when you allow private money in elections, you open the door for bribes and other things to occur. Also, the nine days of in-person voting, that is totally unnecessary. We already have the constitutional right to vote absentee for 40 days. We can request our ballot through mail, online. So it, there's no excuse for that. Also, the concern is that this will allow multiple municipalities to vote in one location. Unraveling that is going to be a nightmare. And I always like to point this out to people. Where are the teams of clerks rising up and saying how great this is? I was talking with someone, I was actually doing an interview and someone brought to my attention that there were clerks who spoke in support, three clerks. So out of 1600 clerks, you've only had three that came forward. And I'm sure these people are hyper partisans. This, this is, cannot be. And then the expanding of drop boxes. I mean, the thing about it is we need to actually secure our drop boxes. So what the goal is, the problem isn't around restricting access. We need to be securing the process as to which our ballots are being handled. So oftentimes they'll say, well, we're, we're looking to expand access, but then you're weakening security. So then you, you've, you've compromised my access. So I'll give you an example. In the city of Ecorse, during the 2022 August primary, uh, there the Wayne County Board of Canvassers had convened and they had discovered in the city of Ecorse, a bag of ballots had not been tabulated. And so here's the thing, yes, these voters had access, they were able to mark the ballot, but their ballot wasn't secured, so it wasn't even tabulated. So what good was it that they marked the ballot? So that's why I really have a big issue when people have this very myopic perspective on voting rights as though ballot access is the end all. Like, no, it's more to it than that. And those people were able to mark their ballot, but it didn't get tabulated. So then their voice still wasn't heard. So what good was it? So I have massive issues with that. The restrictions surrounding um, who can actually audit and verify uh, and check into our election system. I believe our elections are overly complicated. The average person has no idea how our elections actually work beyond registration and actual the end user portion of our election. Elections. It, it, so this will just make more complications to it. So I have massive issues with proposal two, so I will be voting no. Again, what I would like to see happen is us keep the access, but improve security on how the actual ballot is being handled. That's what needs to happen in Michigan. All right. And then finally, I, all three top of the ticket races uh, seem to be closing in according to polls and everything. Uh, would you, how, what would it look like if you were elected and then had to work alongside Dana Nessel and Gretchen Whitmer or one of the two, if, if it is a split top of the ticket executive branch? I would follow the law. I would do my job. I, I do not believe that the people have time, the people of this state have time for petty grievances and people being vindictive or angry or spiteful. That's one of the problems in government is that you have too many people who are putting their needs before the needs of the people. So I will follow the law. If, if they ask me to do something lawful, I would totally do it. Um, if something illegal is happening, I would speak up, but I would work as a team player because it's about serving the people of Michigan, not myself. All right, that'll work. Anything else you want to add? No, I, I just hope to have people's vote on November 8th. I look forward to serving the people of Michigan. Let's let's go fix our state. All right, thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Good luck in the next five days. <laughs> thank you.